Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Animal Medical Center. Thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's webinar, Enrichment for Exotic Pets with Dr. Latoya Latney. Tonight's event will be recorded and we'll post the video tomorrow in case you miss anything or would like to watch it again. Um, we'll be taking questions via chat and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. And now I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Latoya Latney. Dr. Latney is a staff doctor in AMC's avian and exotic pet service. She's board certified in both reptile and amphibian practice and zoo health management. Um, we're so grateful to have her with us to lead tonight's event. And without further ado, Dr. Latoya Latney. Hello, good evening, everyone. So I, I just opened the chat screen. I'm gonna try to do my due diligence to keep an eye on it. Um, <clears throat> So this lecture is going to be um, a little heady in the beginning, but it's going to set up for, for a lot of fun in the after parts of it. Um, one of the biggest things we have to derive from enrichment, which is basically a change or a modification in a pet's environment that allows for them to be able to choose um, how they can interact with their environment um, and actually display normal behaviors. And it has a lot of context when you're thinking about um, part of another major category of health that sometimes uh, when you go to the vet could easily be missed, um, and that's mental health. Um, we know for a fact uh, that the environment really, really, really drives um, how well these animals thrive, thrive in captivity. So we're going to talk a little bit about how your pet's brains are hardwired to work. Um, their natural biology, how they're found in the wild, and then we're going to discuss how that pairs with some of the adaptive changes you can make uh, to enrich their environments. Let me go here. Oh, there we go. Give me one second. I think I have to use the bottom. There we go. So, sorry, won't you, let me use the other controls. So, the goals for today's, or this evening's talk rather, is to review animal cognition, um, enrichment, and how it contributes to their overall welfare. We wanna learn how to integrate your pet's natural biology so that we know how to adapt um, some of their home environment safely to make sure that we're engaging in mental health as well as physical health. So the first thing we wanna do is kind of start off with um, some major definitions. Um, they look really crazy right now, but I swear they're gonna be really, really simple when we go through them. Um, and then we're gonna go through um, species specific ethograms, which is basically a catalog of uh, natural behaviors based on the type of species you're dealing with. And then we'll do some DIY enrichment ideas. Oh, sorry, this is a little glitchy. So the first definition I wanted to cover is welfare. Um, and it's very simple to kind of define. An animal's welfare, um, Essentially, the way we qualify it is the animal's well-being and the humane treatment of animals. The way that welfare is measured um, is based on lifespan, physiology, um, an animal or a person's health status, reproductive success and behavior. But this also includes psychological well-being. And so when we start talking about really, really unique pets, um, it becomes really important to have an idea of what's normal for them so that we can adapt some of what's hardwired um, in the natural behavior so that they can freely be able to engage in those behaviors in captivity. So what is behavior? Uh, that's actually a very, very complicated concept. When we use the term loosely, we're like, oh, that person's behavior is such and such. Um, but its actual definition is um, essentially behavior is a result of internally coordinated responses to some internal or external stimulus. And sometimes the behavior um, may exclude, like sometimes animals will have innate responses um, that uh, they develop as they start to become more sexually mature. And so while sometimes they're not understanding why their behavior is changing, it's in preparation for sexual maturity, which I understand if there's some, some uh, parrot owners in the audience tonight. <laughs> That's a very challenging topic. What behavior is not is a label. Um, 
often when I'm dealing with owners, especially ones that want to adapt um, enrichment plans for their pets or ones that are frustrated by undesirable behaviors that their pets are displaying at home, um, often um, the the concern is brought to either myself or our other clinicians on service. Um, the first thing they start doing is labeling the pet um, as opposed to describing what the actual behavior is. And that's very, pri that's very human primate of us. <laughs> we take a lot of things personally. So it, it, it's very interesting that our instinct is to label the animal and an emotional characteristic based on a response to a stimulus we didn't like, as opposed to just outlining exactly what happened without a judgment. So I tell people to avoid labels. That's not what a behavior is. Dominant, aggressive, spoiled, passive, mean, angry, good, nice. Um, it's very easy for us to get into the habit. You're such a good boy. You're such a good bird. Um, and we say that affectionately. Um, and it has an entire energy and different connotation with it um, when it's used as a positive reinforcer or an interaction that's positive for the pet. Um, but when we say bad, bad bird or something like that, we completely change the dynamic. Um, we change our behaviors by um, the actual adjectives we use to describe the emotion we feel when our pets are doing something we dislike. Um, and because pets speak in behavior, um, hopefully by the end of this talk, the goal is to get you to learn their language as opposed to using yours to try to describe um, and label them actually a very hard thing to do. <laughs> a lot of behaviors will tell you we usually have to untrain the human brain um, to get animals so that we can understand that animals deserve choice too. I tell people to avoid double stereotypes. And again, this is not as easy as it seems. So um, on the one side of the screen, you see the bearded dragon, our tan friend, and it says sold, I'm with stupid. Um, sometimes this is, you know, this is kind of, this is a very negative like meme. Um, but there's some people that think this way um, and that automatically mischaracterizes the relationship that a person could have with that pet if they assume that it does not have an intelligence um, or that um, there's no drive to want to engage in displaying a natural repertoire of behaviors once they're pets. Um, on the flip side, and this is usually me, I usually like to make fun of people that make fun of animals. Um, it says, I don't understand stupid people. Maybe I should take one apart and see how they work. So in a sense, this is a double stereotype too. This is a monitor lizard, a very gorgeous one. Um, and they're actually known for being quite intelligent. Um, they can count to, to 10 that we know of. Um, they display a lot of high cognitive function skills, um, some of which some mammals do not. But most people would look at a reptile and assume that they're not intelligent when in fact, um, they actually have a host of behaviors that um, conclude um, the, like that that's not actually the case. So I tell people to be careful about, again, using labels. Um, sometimes uh, it's an easy trap for us to fall into when we just don't understand their behaviors as well as we would like to, and there's always room to learn. So an ethogram, and this is a picture of my veiled chameleon. Um, he is all kinds of spicy. Um, his, their, their behavioral repertoire is I need to be hidden. Um, they don't, these are not touch animals. These are not hug friendly animals. Um, so I'm learning, he's in a recent adoption, so I'm learning his ethogram, which is a catalog of different kinds of behaviors and activities that I observe that just this one particular chameleon engages in. Now there's some that are going to be species specific, and then there's going to be some that are unique to the personality of the individual. Um, and so every day I have to observe him from afar, and I kind of write down like what he's doing without judgment so that I can appreciate uh, what his repertoire is, and that actually helps me to um, enhance his environment. This is just him hanging out on a trellis right now. Those are jasmine leaves all around him. I basically have plants in the house to make him feel more comfortable when I can take him out of his cage. Then that leads us to cognition. And cognition is basically an animal's mental capabilities. Um, this reviews like mechanisms of learning, memory, perception, and decision making. And there's like subcategories of these actual kind of like areas. And they include the following. So ethology, which we kind of talked a little bit about this, this catalog of behaviors, but when we're studying it under natural conditions, um, that's kind of that one subcategory of cognition, um, different areas of cognition studies. The other one is cognitive ethology. Um, and that's the influence of conscious awareness and intention on the behavior of an animal. Another 
um, subcategory is behavioral ecology. So um, there are those who just study the evolutionary basis um, for animal behavior due to ecological pressures. And then the next categories are the ones, uh, the next three are ones that I think, uh, at least for me, I identify as, as a veterinarian and as a pet owner. So comparative psychology. Um, so this is the behavior and mental processes of animals as they relate to um, history, adaptive significance, and the development of behavior. And kind of under this subcategory, um, they actually teach this in vet school, um, the evolved relationships between humans and animals and how we function together in society. So um, this kind of encompasses the idea of domestication, how the dog and the cat have been domesticated, um, how we've domesticated um, livestock for food, um, how certain large animals have been domesticated um, so that their work animals. Um, this also focuses on the human animal bond, um, which thank goodness I'd say in the last five years has been like a huge revolutionary step that most teaching institutions have engaged in and, and comparatively um, in the veterinary field have a very strong focus on um, really qualifying the human animal bond outside of just overt behaviors, um, which is really, really exciting. And then I'd say the last thing that I tell people that I tend to focus on as um, a veterinarian who we, we take an oath, so we're responsible for the animal's health and first do no harm. And so we have to make sure that the harms are not physical and that the harms are not mental, right? Um, I also engage with like wildlife and have to deal with um, sometimes abuse cases. So this category kind of resonates best with me. Um, this premise for trans species psychology is that humans and animals share a common capacity to think, feel, and experience themselves in their lives. And the goal in this field of study is to prevent and treat trauma in all animals through increased scientific understanding. Oh, that's a picture of me and my monitor lizard. Um, I had just shown you a picture before of how aggressive that like meme was. Um, and here, as you can see, they're actually quite affectionate. Um, she will wait for me to get home and wait for me to kick my records to the side so that she could, you know, hug me for like an hour or so. All right, so that brings us to environmental enrichment. And the kind of take home for that definition is um, any type of environmental enrichment allows an animal to demonstrate their species typical behavior. So something that's an eight to like what a rabbit would do in the wild, normal rabbit behavior. And it gives them control and choice over that environment. And the reason why this is so important is because there's a lot of evidence in the literature that shows that when you keep animals in very restrictive and barren captive environments, um, that it actually does reduce the, their welfare. And then all of those parameters we were talking about, like reproductive success, um, longevity, how long they'll live, those categories go down too when they don't have enrichment. So um, part of it is that we now know their psychological health is actually quite important for their overall physical health. So the next thing I kind of want to move to is how we talk to animals. <laughs> I think this is really important um, because when you're starting to learn how to develop and make toys and an enrichment plan for your pet, um, it's really important to know how we talk to each other and how you can start to learn um, how they interact with the things that you make and learn if they like them or not. And also give you some context to explore making new toys or changes um, or changing parts of their enrichment plan. So often the way that we talk to animals, whether it be consciously or unconsciously, is that we often ignore their behavior, especially when, when an undesirable one is expressed. Um, our, our kind of like, it's almost unfortunate, but most cases, um, sometimes our reinforcement is negative for an experience we have, right? Because it negatively enforces us. Something bad happens, we don't like it, um, and then, we try to correct the behavior for the animal and sometimes that can result in them also experiencing something negative. So I put this little chart in here um, because for those people who are interested in um, learning more about applied behavioral analysis, uh, this is really, really important. Um, notice that the topic of the article that follows for this is how to keep your exotic pet mentally healthy. <laughs> um, and a lot of it is behavior is telling humans uh, you have to remember how your actions influence um, an animal's behaviors. So when we get, when an animal does something that we like, 
uh, we usually like provide an immediate reward or positive reinforcement. And um, I am guilty of this too. Um, my family always says food is love. <laughs> and I see this often with pet owners. Um, usually there's some type of food reward involved. Um, sometimes it's not always food. Sometimes tactile interactions or affection is afforded to a pet to reward them immediately. Um, and then I'd say a slow runner behind that coming in at third place is a repeat of the condition that elicited the behavior. Usually pick up like, oh, they really like that toy. Let me quickly get it to them again so I can see that behavior again. So I tell people it's really important to try to adapt your thinking to highlight their reality. So um, I found this meme to be uh, doubly, <laughs> um, you know, I wanna say moving, because uh, it really does ex express their plight. So you see this turtle looking out the window. It says, it's so beautiful outside and I'm trapped in, in this shell of an existence. Um, it, there's a double entendre here, it's pretty funny, but at the same time, notice that uh, it's not natural for a turtle to be indoors. Turtles, even aquatic ones, are highly migratory. So I joke and say, you know, a turtle's brain is better than most of the GPS functions on our cell phones. <laughs> um, they're designed to migrate miles, sometimes across oceans, um, and they're, you know, moving is something that's very, 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 very important to them, and crossing large territories is something that literally they've been doing for over 200 million years so the idea of keeping them in captivity means like oh yeah i can see how this animal will get bored really 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 quickly so just remember that you know their reality is that sometimes captivity can be stressful it doesn't always have to be um, but what we think is like safe shelter for them they may need a little bit more than that containment sometimes for certain species can be um, a bit stressful their brains are hardwired for their biological functions. Um, actually, it's really hardwired for adaptability. Um, I can't survive, you know, two days in the woods <laughs> without a phone or some type of connection to the rest of the world. And these animals were designed to do that. Um, so that means learning and exploration is really, 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 really important. Uh, so let's go into some of the things that we can do to make their actual um, homes fit these needs. Uh, one thing that I always recommend that owners do um, is to try really hard to unlearn labels. This is something, this is lifelong homework for myself and you included. This is the trust bubble <laughs> we can share here. Um, even myself, even though I'm a pretty strong animal advocate and because it's my primary profession to work with them on a daily basis, I am still myself refining um, you know, the skill set for myself. Really try to take out judgment and look at the situation through their eyes. Um, and that's not quite the same as anthropomorphizing. You'll hear some people use that term. Like, imagine being the animal and how they feel. In a sense, um, our primate reaction is to still react the way a primate would. <laughs> so I tell people to really try to evaluate, um, you know, their lens, like with how their behaviors may be influenced by their environment. And even to this day, I still write down all the individual behaviors without judgment. I try really hard. I go back and read it and make sure I didn't write a judgment down. Um, even for my chameleon, who's, who makes it a hard job to remain uh, non-judgmental. <laughs> and then you want to make sure you can characterize some of these behaviors that you're listing down. Like, are these comfort behaviors? Is the behavior you're seeing associated with a stress? Um, are you witnessing a stereotypy? And a stereotypy is essentially um, a repetitive behavior that uh, kind of does not serve a purpose. Um, it's in response to a stress or maladaptive um, behavior that they learn. So certain things like, um, you know, over caring for feathers and birds or pacing um, is something that you'll see. Um, so th that's kind of a stereotypy. Um, you wanna make sure you're also categorizing if you're seeing a normal behavior or maladaptive behavior. And uh, a lot of self, teaching will go into this, but for the most part, I, I find that most owners really do have a fantastic understanding of their pet's personality and what they know is normal versus abnormal for their pets. Um, and then the other thing I do is I encourage owners to spy on them. So if you ever, you know, hopefully never have to uh, go to a behaviorist, but if you ever do, because you're in a catch 22, you're not sure why your pets all of a sudden elicit like, um, 
engaging in a behavior that's new, um, a behaviorist is going to sit down and say, hey, look, I need you to spy on them. I need to see what they're doing when you're around and when you're not around. They're really like, like fantastic detectives. So this is, um, it says available at, and I have the um, iPhone link and the Google Play link for an app called Presence. And you can put it on your phone or any like touchscreen device you have. Um, what's really unique about this is it basically turns your, your phone or an old iPad into a security camera. Uh, it's a free app and you can set it up in front of your pet's cage and see what they're doing when you're not there. You'd be surprised. I have cameras on my pets. The other thing is you can interact with them as well. So um, you can turn on the live feed at any time. You can set it to, um, there's a motion det detection um, on, feature on the app. So if your pet moves, um, it'll allow the actual um, app will actually record for however long you designate or alert you if you just want to be alerted. Um, if you'd like to talk to your pet <laughs> or interact with them, you can do that. And it's a free app. Um, I've been trained by a number of behaviorists who've um, helped me use this tool. We also use it in wildlife. So, you know, we don't want to have our behaviors um, imprint on animals that we want to go back into the wild while we're caring for them, incidentally, when they're found ill. So this is one way we can observe them in their cages without causing the stress of coming back often um, to do a direct visual, um, you know, checkup on them. Click this here. All right. So how to integrate biology into their enrichment. So um, for me, and I have a plethora of animals, uh, but I also have a plethora of patients. So um, one of the things that I find it's easiest for me to do um, is to kind of understand what their normal wild behaviors are and the amount of time that they afford to those behaviors. Um, it's a, like a sneak peek into how your, your pet's brain was designed. And then I want to compare that to what they're doing as companion animals. Um, and when we kind of tease that apart, we're able to see the ways in which we can modify their environment to give them more choice. Um, and ultimately, that is what the ultimate goal of enrichment is, uh, to give them something to do that lets them engage in a choice and being able to display um, natural behaviors. So at all times, I tell people to remember your pet is training you. We often think it's the other way around. <laughs> um, again, they're experts at um, speaking the language of behavior. Um, we're experts at controlling other animals' behaviors. And so it's not, it, it sometimes it's not instinctive for us to know. We kind of think it's cute, like, oh, my dog meets me all the time at this spot at this time. Um, and if I'm not there, I get a bark or a yelp or something or um, an accident. Um, and they sometimes will modify your interactions with them to push you to do exactly the behavior they want you to execute. Um, and so I have a, a picture, their language is behavior, and I tell people the goal is to learn their language. This is a picture of, um, yes, a 21-year-old crested gecko that uh, has made an enrichment plan for me, I think. So this is Waldo. Um, right here is a picture every day at 8 o'clock p.m. She sits at the front of this cage patiently, waiting for me to come to the cage. And it's, in a sense, it's hilarious, but the first time I didn't pick up on her doing, I was like, I wonder what she wants. So she's sitting right in front of the door handle of the cage. Um, so I open the cage and she crawls into my hand. I give her the choice. She comes into my hand. And I'm like, all right, I'm not sure what she's doing. And she kind of stares at the TV. And I'm like, hmm, maybe she wants to watch TV. Who knows? So I sit her on her little fleece, on a little pillow, and uh, she watches TV every night for about two hours. Um, and it took all of like two days for me to learn this behavior because I figured out, what's scarier than that is that she learned um, what the remote controls do. And so uh, she tends to crawl towards, when she's hanging out with me, she'll crawl over her little fleece. And um, she'll, she'll go and sit on the controllers when she wants the TV to turn on. Uh, somehow she's figured out that that controls <laughs> the light box. And when I turn it on, she's like, great. She crawls right back up onto her little fleece hide and then she watches TV. Now she's a nocturnal lizard. Um, so it's natural for her to be up at night, uh, which is great because I come home and I have to finish records. Um, so this is kind of, I realized that that's a visual, that's a very important visual enrichment source for her. 
and I didn't have to build a jungle uh, in my house <laughs> to be able to engage her mind. So um, I always tell people you, you'd be surprised that even the smallest behavior sometimes really, really um, go a long way. So I, I'm still learning their language too. So I want to start off with parrots because they're a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, the parrot section and reptile section are going to be um, like heavily Evans based, but also very fun and interactive. Okay. So in the wild, this is the main components of parrot behavior. A large part of their day is involved with socialization, foraging, which is this activity of flying around, um, you know, checking for food sources, using their beaks to explore their environment. A large part of their day is also engaged in comfort behaviors and self-care. Uh, self-care for these guys is uh, grooming themselves and aloe grooming, which is grooming of other uh, flock mates, and then sleep. And uh, even though they have our kind of like sleep schedule, but their capacity for deep sleep is a little bit different. They engage in something called hemispheric sleep. So uh, kind of like half of their brain goes to sleep. So this idea of alertness also becomes really important with parrots. Uh, even when you feel like uh, they're out of it, they're almost hyper alert compared to say mammals. So um, their repertoire of behaviors. In the wild, these guys live in communal flocks and there's a lot of social enrichment behind that. Um, the way that I explain what this experience might be for us is kind of like if you live with your father's side and your mother's side's family all the way back two or three generations, all of your extended cousins, all of their kids, um, and you stay with them your entire life. Uh, that's a flock. That's a lot of people. Huge range of personalities to be exposed to. A lot of um, instances in which you're going to be receiving a familiarity with regards to interactions. Um, with a number of individuals. So that's a, that's a wild parrot's life. Um, environmental factors with regards to their ethology, they engage in roosting, um, they do develop, they, they have a change in their behaviors when they become sexually mature. Mating, just like with any animal, ends up being a goal. Um, molting is when their feathers or new feathers are coming in. Um, child rearing or parrot rearing is a big deal to these guys as well. And then their diet. These are all environmental things that are kind of hardwired. Uh, they pair bond, which is one of the reasons why we find them so um, attractive as companions. And they pair bond um, with, um, you know, a, a, a bird mate, I'll put it for lack of a better time. And again, we talked about their time budget. A lot of it, a lot of their time all in a day, all in 24 hours is spent, you know, social interaction, which is really critical. Um, social, 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 really important. And then they're making sure their feathers are doing the most. Um, and then foraging. In comparison, when we look at uh, the situation for captive parrots, completely different, right? So because there is this absence of a flock, um, immediately we're kind of constricted in the amount of social enrichment that we can afford them, that would be natural, right? Um, environmental factors that they experience in captivity is um, sometimes they become sexually mature too soon, Sometimes there's behaviors that they develop um, associated with sexual maturity that become stereotypies. Um, sometimes just because lack of, you know, better availability, um, they're not afforded the best diets. We're still trying to figure that out as nutritionists and veterinarians. Um, usually they are pair bonding with a human or another pet. Sometimes they will, um, you know, show favor towards certain objects, but usually they will bond with a human. And the cases for most captive parrots in the United States, but not in the UK, is that um, in the, you know, the pet industry, these um, baby birds are reared by people and not by um, their bird parents. And so we have found that um, that has a significant um, psychological impact on the way that they develop. Their time budget um, is definitely minimal foraging in comparison to what they would experience in the wild. Um, sometimes minimal social interactions. And so by default, they start to hyperfixate sometimes on another category, and that's with self-care, their feather care. All right. Sorry, there's a little bit of a delay. Okay, there we go. So one thing that um, one of my mentors who is applied behavioral analysis certified, um, she's a reptile practitioner and she's also boarded in avian medicine. She's a current um, rising president for the American Association of Zoo Vets. Um, she's awesome. She's, she's trained 30-year-old birds who have never flown to fly for the first time. 
She has eels get clicker trained to go in the nets. Um, it's amazing how well she's learned how to listen to animals. And then she goes and teaches people how to, to listen to animals, <laughs> which is great. Um, so she's been teaching me this now for over a decade. And um, she initially, when I got into this, she was like, you should look into the literature. You're real evidence-based. You like articles. And I went through it. And it turns out this is the evidence and a snapshot for what we can do to try to um, make these birds less bored <laughs> in captivity. So um, foraging, especially encouraging them to eat or trying to make the goal so that it takes like at least three hours for them to uh, find their meals and toys and to eat them over time, it's actually associated with less boredom. Um, the location of the cage in the house um, actually is quite important for birds. You don't wanna have it near a door or an area um, where they could be easily startled. Um, that actually increases their anxiety. Um, and of course, shaping a good relationship with the owner um, is really, really important. Uh, positive reinforcement during training um, is really, really important. You want to kind of limit the goals to five minutes a day. Um, don't get me wrong. I know there are some parrots that could go for 20 minutes letting you know about yourself and doing the best tricks ever. But when you're first starting out, you want to make sure you keep the approximations pretty simple. Um, because again, it's not necessarily that the bird isn't doing what you wanted to do. Um, it's more that you have to learn how to give the bird choice. And sometimes that means you're actually learning during the training uh, program as opposed to, um, you know, the animal just trying to elicit the behavior you want. So the other thing we always say is allow the bird to say no. And that has to be okay. Um, and that's not something that's inherently normal for us. Um, because Although we have our pets as companions, we do control a lot of their lives. And sometimes when they say no, we're like, well, why aren't you doing exactly what I want all of the time? <laughs> it's just like, why would you do that? Um, increasing their behavioral repertoire is really important. And then letting them be birds is really, really, really important. They're loud, they're messy, they rip things up. They love screaming at people, like they love screaming at each other. That kind of activity should be encouraged. Um, and I have a couple of videos of showing you how adaptable they are. I should be the scariest person like a bird ever meets. And by the end of every veterinary hospital visit, I'm usually in a situation where I've got a bird, like we are like best friends. <laughs> because I allow the bird to be a bird, um, even when they're sick. And again, I should be pretty scary to them. And they're just like, wait, I can scream. I can break this up. I can, it's okay. You're, you're vocally reinforcing me when I make a loud noise. They get pretty excited about the situation. So just to let you know, there's tons of evidence that goes over like toys that we can make for them um, to even help reduce feather picking uh, disorders, which is something that's unfortunately quite common in captive parrots. Um, and a lot of these papers, again, are in a, like in animal cognitive behavioral studies. These aren't conveniently listed in veterinary textbooks. So even a vet has to search for these things to find them. But this is just a PVC toy that they designed for African greys. And they tested like you know, if we make this toy and put the food in it and they mess it, you know, play with it and forage, um, by what percentage can we get them to reduce causing trouble to their feathers, like to change, you know, their area of focus? And it turns out um, they were able to reduce feather picking almost by three times as, as often by just giving them a toy, which is a very simple intervention. Um, and PVC pipes are really easy to find in all kinds of dimensions and easy to work with. Um, this is not for anyone to memorize. I just wanted to show you like, if you went in and said foraging dash bird on Google Scholar, all these things come up. <laughs> so again, there's a lot of information. I, it takes me a long time to even instinctively look this stuff up, but like you can see like there's scientists who are testing like color size, the size of the rope, the thickness of the rope, based on what species you're dealing with, what their favorite enrichment toy is. Um, it's very interesting. Um, definitely know Amazon's um, cockatoos, they enjoy like crush um, types of enrichment when they're like biting through things. Then we have some animals that like to rip things apart. Like they all have different personalities. They're not a monolith. So um, I just wanna show you, this bird is 35 at this time, had never been away from home. Um, again, I'm the scariest person it's gonna meet. This bird had bitten everyone in the hospital but me. Uh, known as a pretty like quote unquote aggressive like we labeled a bird. He had a tumor on his chest. I said, Dad, this is non-negotiable. I have to take it off. You go home, have some wine. 
I will video how your bird's doing from home uh, just to give you an update. So this is the day after the surgery. Notice he has a collar because he's a chronic um, feather plucker. I hope you guys can. Can you guys hear that? So I'm vocally reinforcing him. I'm repeating his behavior. I'm telling him this is what I want to hear too. By the way, birds love to hear you laugh. So this is very bold of me, but he's showing me behavior that he's receptive. So I pet his head, he's walking towards me. And after this, he tells us that he's okay. <laughs> My interns in the background saying, I, it's like, I'm glad he's feeling good today. This is a shock to everybody because he's maimed everybody that's come to the hospital. They can't believe. Now notice, I'm not toweling the bird. I'm not telling him to step up. I have the door open. I'm just curious to see how he wants to interact with me. The last memory this bird had was going under anesthesia and me doing surgery. So I look scary with a face mask, the whole thing. Next morning, this is how quickly he forgave me. Notice it keeps getting closer and closer to my face. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if you heard my intern finish the last comment, but he's saying, next thing you know, he's going to ask you to pet him under the wing, which is a very sexual area for a bird. So again, um, this is in a hospital environment, less than 24 hours. Again, I'm the scariest thing this bird should ever experience in his life. And I, I change my behavior when I don't have to put my, like to control his, even in a hospital setting. Um, and I'm paying close attention to his approximations. I'm positively reinforcing his wanting to flip the bowl over, destroying things in the cage. I've given him a bunch of things to rip up. Um, I'm repeating his behaviors. I'm repeating how loud he is. And I do that very quickly to show him like, I like that you're doing that. And with these videos were taken within like 20 seconds of each other, it went from a, I'm exploring the situation. It's like I, I met the demands of his interview and all of a sudden he became very affectionate with me, which is actually not a behavior that um, was demonstrated at home very often. So I sent this to the owner <laughs> and I was taking videos just to let him know your bird is doing okay in the hospital. It's, you know, it's 30 years of relationship and these people, this bird and this owner have never been separated before. It's very stressful for the, the pet owner. And he gets on the phone, he's just like, I can't even believe. He was like, he must be bonded to you. I was like, nope, the only thing I've done is given him choice. It seems like it's really simple, but it's actually, uh, it can even be done in a veterinary context. So I just shared this because um, I know it can be very scary for pet owners to have to leave their pet at the hospital, but you'd be surprised. A lot of the time we're trying to make sure they're having a party while they're there. So what does enrichment truly look like? For a bird, it looks like a crazy cage. <laughs> it looks like a crazy jungle gym, you know? It looks like things need to be ripped apart. Things have been bitten onto, you know, things have been grinded down. Things need to be replaced. That's normal, okay? In the wild, they have wings. They can go everywhere and do this foraging process. But in a captive situation, um, you know, they're going to continue and continue and continue to rip things up. That is natural behavior for a bird. Um, so this is just to kind of show you, this is a black cap conure. Uh, my student put a, the, the presence app on him and put a little camera on him um, when she started clinics because um, she was away for long periods of time. And we were trying to figure out what he was doing when she wasn't there. He sat in the corner of the cage and didn't move until she came home. It was so depressing. So we were like, we gotta kind of jazz this guy's life up. So as you can see, he's very proud of himself. He doesn't even care there's another bird there. This is his cage. This bird is smaller than a cockatiel, for those of you who aren't familiar with the species, tiny. And we do all this all day. And when mommy comes home, mommy lets him act like a normal bird. He enjoys all of these things. And his food is in there, his treat's in there. <laughs> He's gonna keep working at it to get it out. Um, notice his, his feathers are pristine. It's because he's paying attention to destroying his toys, um, which is a natural behavior. So, 
everyone always wants to know uh, what enrichment looks like. And I tell them it, it looks like a good time, okay? <laughs> Should look like a party, confetti, explosions all over the place. Look how proud, look how indignant he's, I'm proud of myself. Look, I got my Nutriberry. I'm so important. There you go. So we, we kind of make them work a little bit um, because this is what they would have to do in the wild. So now I'm gonna move to rabbits and I'm hoping and keeping time. Rabbit ethograms, or their catalogs of uh, normal behaviors. So, a bunch of words, don't worry, we're gonna work through this, okay? So, in the wild, which is always a shock to owners, uh, these guys are incredibly territorial. You know, they dig burrows. Um, they're not the best um, moms and dads in the world. <laughs> um, so, they're, they're not great on mother care, and this is one thing that those of us um, that have to deal with wildlife uh, it drives us nuts where people are like, we found these baby rabbits <laughs> at like 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, and they found them in some burrow and we're like, mom will be back. This is kind of like their natural behavioral repertoire. They're not with their babies at all hours of the day. Um, but they're very territorial. They guard their burrows. They have one of the highest metabolic rates for all mammals on the planet. And this is what makes rabbits stellar and amazing. This is, we have like little National Geographic all-stars in our houses, okay? 30 to 70% of the day, they're searching for food. And they need to do that um, because they need to eat enough to keep this metabolic drive going. So they eat more and consume more energy than like a 30, like a 300 kilogram steer. Uh, so if you can imagine that, something much bigger than that, they actually have to eat more frequently and eat more calories than that thing does just to keep baseline level. They engage in a complex array of social behaviors in groups. Um, they also engage in a lot of comforting behaviors. So grooming themselves, grooming their friends or um, the, the rabbits in their group um, and hopping. So exploratory behaviors are also really important. Digging, sniffing, gnawing. And although we don't like that, we don't want them gnawing on the carpet, like that's hardwired. So I tell people like, if you want a rabbit, <laughs> understand that's a behavior uh, they're gonna engage in. They're also a prey species. So um, they're designed to alert others and to become alert and be able to literally freeze and jet. And they're able to do that and move very quickly because um, it evades predators and it confuses predators. So when we compare that to what we're seeing in captive bunnies, um, this is a study, um, it's from the UK where they were, the owners were asked to qualify the behaviors they see with their pets um, and then they also gave them labels, which was hilarious. But these are a catalogs of those behaviors. The same way I would ask you to write down your pest behaviors. This is what this group of um, rabbit owners in the UK did. And they qualified it by percentages. So most of the time their pet was alert, but inactive. Uh, they were social like 16% of the time. And as you see, as you go down, social almost supersedes grooming, supersedes resting, supersedes eating almost. Notice social is at the top of the list. So that works, right? Because we're social and maybe this is why they work out so favorably for us um, as pet owners. I keep forgetting this little thing here. There we go. So how can we adapt their behaviors in a way where we can um, develop enrichment for them? So we have to give them opportunities geared toward, we just, what, what, geared toward what it is we just discussed. So we need to let them dig, we need to let them shred, we need to let them engage in exercise. Um, I'm gonna you know, plead the fifth here. I, I, I tell pet owners this, I tell wildlife rehabbers this, and they freak out all the time. Uh, know that this is a trust bubble, I still love bunnies because I take care of them through all of their old age issues. Um, I actually had a 15 year old rabbit come in about a month and a half ago. So when I say we do a good job by keeping them into their prime, we do. But Mother Nature designed them um, to reproduce at a really young age um, because they're not really meant for longevity in the wild. So they are reproducing at the ripe and tender age of four months to six months after they're born. And it's very rare for in the wild us to see rabbits really get past a year and a half, if that. So when we're keeping our pets up to 10 years or like to 15 years, it makes sense to know that parts of their bodies are going to have age-related changes, just like us. And one of those things is arthritis. Um, and it's very common in them. People are always shocked. It's like a five-year-old bunny. I was like, oh, he's got a little arthritis in his knees. And they're like, oh my God, what am I not doing? And I was like, it's not what you're not doing. Uh, their bodies, you know, start to change with age. And we're, we're, you know, 
we're dealing with Gandalf the Grey. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not um, LeBron James. So <laughs> there's a huge age difference that I think sometimes we don't recognize because we're just really good as pet owners at getting them to ripe old ages. Um, so for me, letting them exercise is paramount part, non-negotiable with regards to how you keep a rabbit. They have to exercise or we will see them develop very painful conditions as they get older. And I have limited options in being able to help with that. So vertical jumping, running, darting. Um, my Dutch used to do zoomies um, and thump on my, on my foot when I didn't lead chase. It was insane. Um, binkies is when they do these jumps and they do these luckies, um, lucky charm sidekicks in midair. <laughs> um, I, I've seen rabbits do parkour, like my Dutch would do parkour. She would jump, ricochet off the side of the wall and to get onto like a desk that's like five feet in the air. I, the amount of height she would cover would astound me all of the time. They are jumpers. That's where they're designed to do. Their back muscles are super crossfit. It is a beautiful design that they have. So they should be able to, you know, engage in their normal physical activity repertoire. Um, at the same time, they really enjoy grooming. They enjoy petting. That social, remember, we said was really, really high up on the list what was important for their natural repertoire behaviors. And that's why we, as pet owners, get along so well with bunnies. Um, and then scent enrichment is really important for them, too. Um, so there's some things that we can do to play with that. And we're going to show some examples leading forward. But I just want to get through all of the rodents and the rabbits. Um, pet rats, uh, for those of you who have pet rats, um, we are in the love bubble here. Um, pet rats almost mirror our time budgets like to a T, which is amazing. Um, and I think this is why for those of us who have had pet rats, we get so attached. Um, they don't live very long and it is heartbreaking. It is so heartbreaking to know that we have such a short period of time with such amazing companions. Um, social time is important to them. Affection is important to them. Food gathering, sharing meals, sharing meals is important to them. Um, you know, my adopted family is Italian, like food is love. <laughs> so this is, this is something that resonates very strongly um, with a lot of us. Grooming, they're meticulous about their self-care, they'll groom you. Um, problem solving, task-driven behaviors, exploratory activities, they enjoy these things. Uh, they have exercise repertoire as well. Hiding, hoarding, hoarding is when they grab something that's coveted and they run and they go stash it somewhere secret. Um, and they engage in athletics. Um, I love pets, um, pet rats, where they would, you know, they'll do planks. So you reach your arm out and they'll run all the way um, up and down your arm. Um, and empathy is really important. And I just kind of have a timestamp here, just like a label of um, one of the more, I want to say recent studies that kind of go over the pro-social behavior in rats and their empathy. Um, and then I always like to have this little meme here because some people are kind of freaked out by rats and it's okay. You don't have to like rats, but it's really important to know why uh, pet owners get so attached to them. Um, they are again, not their labels. They're not their stereotypes. They're actually quite affectionate and really, really um, amazing companions. So rat enrichment, knowing that they have to dig, um, you're going to be 90% of your pet's enrichment. Um, a lot of the time they want to spend with you, um, which I can say, Aside from like some cats and dogs, there's not many animals that 100% of the time just want to be attached to your hip. These guys do. Um, so I have a kind of a picture of one rat cage that's kind of dynamic, but I wanted to show you some ways in which you can set up really, really fun, um, you know, dynamic spaces for these guys um, by using things that you find around the house. And especially when we're trying to get them to eat a better diet. So one has a toilet paper roll, stuff with booze kind of hanging. And then this one right here is basically like um, a bunch of boxes with tubular um, cardboard set in between them. It's based, like the most, I want to say, intricate rat maze I've seen with things that you can grab from around the house. And let me tell you, these rats are so happy about it. <laughs> they could care less if it came from Target or if it's an Amazon box. The fact that they get to explore the environment is, is pretty important and key for them. Then we'll move to uh, guinea pigs. Um, guinea pigs are hilarious, <laughs> um, but we're going to go over their, their time budgets first, and then we're going to talk about that reverse training thing again. So while guinea pigs um, kind of hide in large social groups um, in grassland crevices, like in Peru, uh, they're a prey species. So not only do other animals eat them, they're actually a pretty big food source for people. Um, they hang out during the daytime. 
Um, in the lab animal world, they're actually studied for their diverse range of vocalizations. Um, they have a number, like thousands. It's pretty impressive. Um, hides are important. They never like to be in a situation where they're in the middle of a floor and there's no place to run and hide. Um, they're eating nonstop and they're quite social. Um, their adapted enrichment should mean that there's hides everywhere. This is a CNC cage with chloroplast um, box around it. And this is a very common way that we set up a large floor space um, adapted for pet guinea pigs. There should be hide boxes, tubes, everything for them to be able to feel secure so that they can engage in exploring. If they feel as though they're in the center of a floor with no place to get to to hide, they will be stationary and it sets up a lot of pressure on their knees and their feet. And that's a common problem we see on the veterinary end where they get like pretty severe osteoarthritis in their knees and they get pododermatitis on their feet um, because they're too afraid to explore um, the areas in which they're, they're coming from. Uh, so remember tunnels and hides are very, very important and exercise. Exercise is so important. Uh, I know we joke and say like sometimes they're sedentary, but when I have the six or seven year old come in, the first thing I'm checking on is their heart. Um, and a lot of them do develop cardiac disease. Um, and it's because sometimes that they're not um, engaging in enough exercise at home. Um, we're not that dissimilar in terms of how our anatomy works because we're all mammals. Um, so I tell people to make sure they allow their guinea pig to feel safe enough to explore multiple areas because um, it really does um, affect the amount of exercise they can engage in and it's almost like preventative health for them. Chinchillas. This is a picture of one that must have been in the wild in the 1920s um, when they were in large numbers in the wild before we tried to hunt them into extinction in the 1920s. These guys existed in mountain ranges. They have excellent eyesight, excellent and excellent hearing. Uh, they're nocturnal, they hang out at night. So if that's not your bag, then this, you know, you don't wanna adapt behaviors or enrichment that are gonna be primarily focused on during the daytime. Um, they are in social groups in the wild. Uh, usually they'll form like very short harems. The female is the more dominant sex. Um, so they can be a little territorial, um, typically, um, unless you start to bond with a chinchilla pretty early on, they're not team like, come pick me up. They're not team like, I want to be touched all of the time. So this is one of those animals that sometimes demands <laughs> that you allow them to have choice. And I tell people, if you want a happy chinchilla, just pay attention to them. Let them come to you. Um, they let you know what interactions are appropriate. Um, so high box security, safe ways to explore vertical spaces is very important for them. Uh, you kind of want to reduce the handling. They look like a cartoon, and I'm not joking. I know they look like a teddy bear, but that's not really why. <laughs> you know, they look different than the amount of touch or tactile receptivity they actually, like, would enjoy. Also, don't wake them up in the middle of the day. It's, like, the rudest thing you can do, okay? Gerbils. Let's see if I'm keeping time here. I've got 15 more minutes. Um, hamsters and gerbils. Um, for the most part, these are, like, very big generalizations. Um, but I just wanted to kind of more show you the very inventive ways in which you can set up definitely hamster tunnel, and in some ways gerbil tunnels as well. So their olfaction is immaculate, like way better than yours. Don't try to have a sniffing contest with these guys. They think we smell awful. Um, and if you think I'm joking, put your hand in a hamster's cage real fast. The first thing you see is them go like, oh, don't touch me. Um, it's pretty aggressive and hilarious. Uh, even the polite ones are like, ew, you're disgusting. I always laugh. It always makes me laugh that they're like, ew, humans are gross. <laughs> um, they tend to be task driven to hoard. So like they grab food, they grab coveted items, and they go hide it and, and stash it in secret places. Um, in the wild, they would be living in social groups. Uh, you have to be very careful. They have some very, very, there's a very delicate balance between their hierarchy. And so um, forced um, social groups can result in a lot of um, injured animals. For the most part, they're kind of like chinchillas. They're in this anti-touch category where like, hey, let me let you know. So I always offer my hand for them to smell first. You don't want to ever like try to bare hand grab um, an unsuspecting hamster or gerbil. You might, they might negatively reinforce you pretty quickly. <laughs> so um, I tell people make tunnels out of everything. I've seen people redo Ikea desks, like both multiple level Ikea desks, drill holes in them. Um, and then make all kinds of tubular tunneling experiences for them. You don't have to redesign furniture. You literally can make tubes out of, as you can see here, cardboard dowels. Um, 
and it's not it's actually not that difficult these animals are quite lightweight um, so it's I think this is reinforced with popsicle sticks <laughs> which is something you might have around the house if you have kids um, so yeah just be mindful that um, setting those these guys up for fun activities doesn't mean you have to drain your wallet at Petco or PetSmart um, other forms of rodent enrichment um, again touch I saw this, I thought this was pretty cool. Um, and I've seen uh, sea turtles do this as well too. If you have like PVC pipes under the water and you have like um, kind of like scrub brushes strapped to them, um, having something that an animal can kind of rub that might um, give like a, like a petting or scratching sensation um, is really, really nice. I thought this was pretty cute to see this, this little hammy enjoys um, a soft bristle toothbrush. So I think I'm gonna start strapping some uh, dollar store toothbrushes on the sides of the cages of my pets to see if they use them. I'll put the cameras on and see if they enjoy it. Um, these are just some things that kind of go over how to make um, what I like to call discovery boxes, cardboard boxes um, for digging and exploring. Uh, this would apply for rabbits and most rodents. Again, it's a cardboard box, um, some butcher's paper, um, and then some treats, some toys, something that we know that they're gonna like. I think there's parsley in here, a couple of pellets, um, a carrot piece. And this kind of just goes over how you, you know, you make a dig box for them. Um, you can get very inventive with hay bins as well. I tell people to make sure you make these animals stretch um, because when I go to do their physical exam, I can feel so much tension in their necks if they've been, if they've had their head down, eating in a downward position, especially for the herbivores. Um, they get a lot of neck tension. So I tell people to make sure that we're engaging in behaviors that allows them to use the full, you know, range of motion of their neck. Um, this is just an egg carton that's been cut out and it's been uh, kind of attached to the cage side with zip ties. Um, and this is packed full of hay. Um, this one here just looks like it's like an, like, um, kind of like a, like a little utility basket. Um, and again, they've modified it just to have it so that the hay can hang on the side as opposed to on the bottom of the cage. Um, I used to make this for my rabbit. It takes a little time. Make sure you get yourself a good pair of scissors, but essentially you need one cardboard box and a pair of scissors. Uh, this is a, a, what I call a dig tray. And so you cut these pieces of cardboard horizontally um, and you kind of stuff them in the bottom of the box and allows them to dig, 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 dig. Um, I also used to save like when we used to have them like the white pages phone books and my Dutch would grab them and throw them like and rip the phone books apart. Um, it used to be funny. I used to just see paper go everywhere. It looked like there was a paper shredder in my apartment. Um, paper toy enrichment is okay too. So if you do get the paper, um, just even to play small little treats and let them explore. Um, again, if you have any paper towel rolls, you can always stuff hay in there, treats. Uh, cardboard is going to become your friend. Then we're just going to skip to hedgies very quickly. Um, wild hedgies. These guys are fossorial burrowers. Like their aim is not to make people happy. I, I hate to say it that way, but um, they're super cute. This is one of those animals where like when you get them, you want to make sure you're enjoying that you can observe them. You have to be very careful about putting um, your primate pressures on them. So they don't have really good eyesight, but they have an excellent sense of smell. Um, and they've got some pretty unique skin muscles. Um, they're very, very advanced. Um, fun fact, African pygmy hedgies um, actually have an anti-venom in their system. So like when they get bit by cobras and stuff, they just like wax that out. They're totally unaffected. <laughs> and I'm just like, that's awesome. Uh, that's my fun fact for them. They can survive mamba bites. Um, I wish I had that as an innate you know, superpower. <laughs> that in addition to the spikes, which are way awesome. Uh, they're nocturnal, so they don't want to be bothered during the daytime. And um, you have to be very careful with drafts in these guys. So if you happen to move your cage and it's near an area that's drafty, they usually will need some thermal support. Um, and I know it sounds crazy, but they're the pets that we have in the pet trade are African pygmy hedgehogs. Um, they weren't designed to tolerate temperatures that are very low that might seem comfortable to us. So these guys need hide box security. Um, they also like a lot of scent enrichment. Uh, they will do something called anting. And um, it's when they smell something, sometimes it can be offensive, sometimes it can be something that they really like. Um, I've had like them ant with me all the time. Um, they'll start to froth. And then they'll cover the saliva all over their bodies. It's a really interesting reaction. <laughs> but I've seen them do it 
in times where I thought they were like, it was something positive. Um, not, I've never seen them do it when they've been distressed. Um, so I just, for those of you who are maybe new to um, hedgehog behaviors, you do want to reduce handling. Um, some people like to make them, you know, put them in scenarios where they're doing a bunch of pictures and photo shoots and stuff like that. And like, don't get me wrong, their personalities will start to bud. They tend to bond with um, their caretaker. Um, they're not super social in general. Like this is not like a bird that needs to be the star of the show everywhere it goes. Sugar gliders. Ooh. Yeah, so these are marsupials that thought that they had the right to fly. Yeah, yeah, that's basically what they are. They're intense. <laughs> I always make fun of sugar gliders because like marsupials in general, because I'm like, why? Your anatomy's all over the place. Uh, your needs are all over the place. They, I, but all jokes aside, I'm a pretty aggressive advocate about how they should be treated in captivity and how they should be treated in captivity is that I don't think they belong in captivity. <laughs> so they have huge ranges um, in the wild and they're arboreal and they glide like they full on travel like a lot of height. You, you have to be careful. Um, you do not want any open pipes near these guys. They have a very specific diet that is very difficult and challenging to replicate in captivity without causing nutritional issues. Um, and they kind of operate at a low body temperature because somewhere in the evolutionary chain, they thought they wanted to be reptiles and then they changed their minds. Um, so one thing that I find is that, you know, when someone asks me, you know, what size should the cage be for, you know, my male sugar glider? I was like, it, it shouldn't be a cage. It should be a room. He should have a room. <laughs> like wall it off, give him his due. Um, but I know you can't get two city blocks into a cage. So what ways can we, you know, increase their territory? Um, because they are territorial. Um, and so this is one unique picture I saw. Um, you want to make sure that the cage environment has a lot of unique hides and a lot of uh, crevices and places. So you want to kind of, in a sense, give them more territory in the space that you're affording them. Um, they do like puzzle toys. They love foraging. So um, you want to make sure you try to um, make their enclosures as dynamic as possible. And you don't necessarily have to use a bunch of expensive things to do this. So this is a Tupperware. I think there's like some chains on it or something like that. You could use rope. Um, it's just upside down with a hole in the center. Um, again, they like little burrows. Uh, this is a milk jug with some treats in it. <laughs> and they just cut open a hole there. Um, these are those little silly pom-poms I always see at the craft store. Um, it's a nice little burrowing substrate for them. This I saw and I was like, that's what's up. So like if you happen to have, you know, house plant or like even artificial house plants, it might be a good idea to put some of them above the cage to simulate um, the feeling of being in trees. Um, I can only imagine for this, these guys that could be so in reinforcing, um, especially considering they're, they're so arboreal. So I just want to share that. Um, Kind of summarizing all the rest of the um, small mammal things, uh, you can use step stools and fleece, 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 fleece to make tiny little hides for them. Um, this is just kind of like a group of guinea pigs. Uh, this is just, some people will use, what do you call them? Uh, clothes pins. Sometimes people will use clothes pins. Sometimes you can just tie pieces of hay um, along a string and again, have them reach up to reach for some of their food items. Um, I've actually had some of the wood toys for this uh, puzzle boxes for rabbits, but you can use like a little cake pan. And if you have little paper um, cupcake holders, you can crumble them in, put treats, put them in different places, um, and then have them play with the maze to kind of figure out which one has the treat in it. Um, essentially, any container you have, you can rip up some old t shirts. Um, old pieces of fleece. You can make these guys little dig boxes. It doesn't have to be elaborate. You just have to catalog their reaction to it. They're usually pretty happy about it. Um, another thing that I find is really helpful is making um, cardboard, like hanging cardboard toys. And this is probably true for my rodent friends and my bird friends, because um, cardboard is usually readily available in my household um, from a number of sources. And so this is a cheap, inexpensive thing that can be replaced, um, can be used and repurposed. This one here has like some wood blocks, but you'll see there's food in between there. Uh, this is just little egg cartons um, with shredded paper in it, and there's a treat in there. So there's ways you can use cardboard in a number of ways to make things pretty exciting for our pets, especially our herbivores. Uh, this is a cardboard dowel. Uh, this is just has stuff with hay. This is paper bag. 
Um, you can make little tunnels out of these little cardboard dowels. And I'm not sure if you can see this bunny here. This looks like um, almost like a cup holder you would get from like, I don't know, having gone to Starbucks or something. Just poke holes in the bottom of it, flip it over, and you can actually stick, you know, apple wood sticks in there, veggies, um, just so, again, they're not eating with their heads directed towards the floor. Uh, sometimes you can use cup holders in unique ways for our little hamster friends. Uh, you can cut up the cardboard and hide things in there for our rat friends. Again, here's the clothespins with some of the food items. You just want to make sure these animals aren't nibbling on the clothespins for obvious reasons because there's metal on there. And then this is almost like a wiffle ball theory <laughs> with a cardboard, but just pieces of um, food items stuck into it. Rabbits go crazy for it. Okay, ferrets, these little nuggets. These guys are polycyclic sleepers, so they sleep a lot of the day. Um, these are Mother Nature's mercenaries. Uh, their relatives are otters and wolverines, so they have a high hate, like prey drive, like they like to hunt. Um, their brain is dominated by smell because they, they live in burrows in the wild, so they don't see very well. Um, and the lighter the coat color pattern that they are, we've actually scientifically proven that that's associated with deafness as well, so they don't hear very well. Um, especially when we start to change the genetics for the coat color. Um, so tunnels is going to be really important. You could use large cardboard tunnels. You could use PVC pipes, um, Tupperwares to make dig boxes, cardboard boxes to make dig boxes. And they're very, very scent driven. So you just want to make sure you're careful with the scents that you give them. It's not uncommon for ferrets to hoard. They will grab your, your socks out of the laundry and run it and hide it somewhere in some treasure trove that they have. It's not uncommon. Um, and then we have reptiles. Uh, this is my turtle watching Netflix. And I'm going to tell you how this came to be um, because it's hilarious. So it turns out um, in the wild, reptiles have a range of behaviors. Most of them are heat seeking, basking, um, engaging in exploration, locomotion, food and mate search, socialization. So yeah, these guys do interact with each other. They're not cold and callous, okay? In the wild, they have to engage in task-driven behavior, so problem-solving, exploration, feeding, mating, um, and then thermoregulatory behavior. In captivity, their um, learning opportunities are really minimized. Um, their exploration um, opportunities are kind of minimized as well. Functional behavior, locomotive behaviors, food is delivered to them, they don't have to hunt. Um, and then their social pressures are reduced. Um, the biggest thing they need to do is focus on keeping warm, and most of us can handle that as a chore as a pet owner. Um, they are very smart. You start adapting certain things and you find out they enjoy exercise. This is one of our little Snyder skinks. My owners were like, he really likes to interact with things. I was like, put some kids' toys in there, see what happens. And they got a hamster wheel, and this guy gets on this hamster wheel like four times a day. So that's the way we get him to exercise and feel like he's going someplace. Um, they have been shown to have some pretty strong problem solving skills. And I just kind of want to show you what that is. Um, I used to keep a Knowles. These are some of the smartest animals on the planet, I promise you. Um, they're able to the display behavioral flexibility for multiple cognitive tests. This guy can tell you where the treat is. You can change it multiple times. He knows where it is. Turtles obviously have very long-term memory, spatial memory retention. Um, they're really good at mazing. That makes sense. I get lost every day. My turtle likes to remind me that I'm a slow primate and she walks me to the refrigerator because clearly I can't remember where it is. Um, and she's very patient about it. Uh, but when you think about what they do in the wild, they migrate, they come back to the same place, sometimes 20 years in a row, 30 years in a row, 100 years in a row. So um, mazes are very fascinating to them. Um, they can actually discriminate between shapes. Um, and then we have our Mensa Club members. These are like our African greys in the, the reptile world. <laughs> our monitor lizards are pretty smart. Um, they can teach each other and learn from each other. Um, they can imitate each other, which is really interesting. This was a study done um, in bearded dragons. Um, you can change the rules a lot and they will still be able to um, show you that um, they can learn and anticipate things. So the fun thing about this chart is that they, um, it's interesting to see how bored monitor lizards get. So the first trial they chose incorrectly, second trial they got it down, and then almost for the rest of the 10 trials they got it right. They missed it once, and honestly I think they were probably trying to train the person at that point. There's one back here. 
Um, and this is why I thought maybe I should probably see if my turtle would, would be interested in looking at an iPad. So I found this paper that says, not only do turtles um, know how to discriminate with touchscreen devices, um, but they can use it to navigate, you know, a maze. I was like, wow, <laughs> like, are you serious? I was like, I don't know if my turtle's doing all of that, but let's just see what happens when I show it to her. And sure enough, my turtle uh, really appreciates the visual enrichment of looking at the iPad. She will go on the hunt in my apartment looking for the iPad. Um, sometimes I'll just leave it on for her during the day. Um, the other things we like to do is try to bring the, the outdoors in. So I have a Russian tortoise. Um, this is, you know, they're from the Middle East um, in the Russian steppes. So I try to like plant tortoise safe grass and little Tupperwares um, to bring it indoors so that she can have um, some areas to engage in normal grazing behaviors. Um, this is her and her little cat TP uh, with her fleece towels. Yes, she goes in there and goes to sleep, comes out every morning. This is her where's my breakfast face. Um, this is one of my ball pythons. So for some reason, I find they really enjoy visual enrichment to watch the entire Netflix comedy special right there <laughs> the whole time. Uh, some people will use tubes as well. You can use PVC pipes I use for my guys to increase um, the dimensions of exploratory behavior, especially for snakes. Snakes get really sedentary. And then when I do cat scans on them, I see they've got arthritis all down their back. So they were, they were not designed to sit in a box. You gotta make sure you exercise them. And then um, again, back to cardboard. For some reason, <laughs> I have yet to find a pet that does not like it. <laughs> so this is one of my ball pythons kind of hanging out in a cardboard doll. This is the gecko watching TV. This one, my ball pythons tend to be very tactile responsive to um, and scent motivated to be near things that smell like me. So, um, I usually will throw like a t-shirt in there. It's quite comforting. Um, it's very rare that they want to sit on the sofa. They're usually are some way wrapped near me or touching me. Um, so, um, and that makes sense because in the wild ball, pythons are actually a prey species. They get eaten by other animals. So again, that sense of security, if you get that kind of honed in really early on is really important. Then we have frogs, our amphibian friends. Um, hiding enrichment, different types of um, substrate textures. Um, I explored with my bullfrog. Um, I used to put a bunch of different types of textures on the bottom of the cage. Um, sound is really important. I have two um, Vietnamese fire belly toes that like to sing to me every time I visit my friend. And apparently it's just a behavior <laughs> that they've adapted when I come in because I tend to sing a lot. <laughs> um, not even food motivated. I thought maybe they thought I'm gonna come in and feed them all the time. But when you think about it, they actually have a whole range of vocalizations. So that might be another area to explore. Fish. For those of you who have fish or are interested, this is a fantastic uh, listen to if you have Audible. Um, it's an overview, a very um, like lay but scientific or overview of how smart fish are. Um, it's really, really fascinating. Um, depending on the species, you really have to learn what their natural behaviors are. Um, but there's simple ways you can set up enrichment for specific species as well. Um, most fish I find that are like captive fish really enjoy your company. This is a picture from an article that came out where archer fish um, were using touch screens to compare um, facial recognition. They compared the fish's results to I think juniors in um, college and it turns out that the archer fish performed better by squirting the water and matching the, face, the faces to the faces better than the juniors in college. So when you think about their level of visual discrimination is pretty important. So you can play with those ideas as well. You can also make caves and hides for them. And then this is the last thing, I swear to goodness. Hermit crabs! I'm, I don't know why I like hermit crabs so much what I do. And um, I do find that these guys like goldfish, like budgies, are unfortunately um, underestimated for the complexities of how they should be kept. They're kind of diminished as like beginner pets um, when you can afford them a really great quality of life by setting them up really well. Um, so just remember, these guys should be offered salt and um, like marine salt water and fresh water. Um, they're scavengers in the wild. Um, they should have a dynamic range, they're pretty mobile too. So you wanna make sure you afford them a really fun setup. Um, I actually found this, which was awesome. Um, just the exercise, um, someone actually um, has a hamster wheel in their cage for their, their hermit crab and by choice they go and they exercise. I'm like, it's gonna live to 30, which by the way, they can do.
they are not disposable pets. So in summary, this is your shopping list. Um, this will be made available to you. Um, cardboard, all the things around your house, bubble wrap, Tupperwares of all sizes, shredded paper, paper cups, um, paper cupcake cups, um, in your fridge, if you have any large plastic containers that can be adapted as hides um, for visual enrichment, TV, radio, um, be careful about the channel that you play. My African Grey one time learned some naughty words <laughs> when someone changed the radio station. Um, clothing is another thing that you have around the house that's really important. Um, scent reinforcement is very important to a number of our pets. So old t-shirts, um, pillowcases, small pillows, I love a fresh net laundry bin. Um, I put a bunch of clothes in there, a bunch of my saris, and then I'll put like my ball python in there and he'll have an explorer high. He'll have a really good time. So that's a really simple way to adapt, um, you know, almost like a burrowing pit um, or like a fun ball pit, like Chuck E. Cheese's for your pet. Um, secondhand store, these are some things you can get. Um, my, for some reason, Rather than remote control cars, my turtle loves teddy bears. So I go to a secondhand store and I get the most. I love it. It's a reuse reusable enrichment toy. Just wash it, put it in there. Um, she likes to cuddle under teddy bears all the time. Uh, kid wood blocks work really well, old sheets. You go to the craft store, these are some things you can pick up as well. For those of you that have fish or aquatic pets, you can get these items as well. I mean, I would say if you're going to a home goods store, um, uh, PVC pipes, electrical tape, and then get a Dremel so that you can sand edges and make things smooth or put holes in plastic containers in a way that's really easy. Um, so those would be the things that I would pick up, okay? And then I think, what was the last one? Here's the list of things which will be made available to you. Um, this is kind of the summary. Uh, we just have to learn their language. We know what enrichment means. It's a way in which we change an environment to improve the well-being of a pet. Um, and sometimes it's not as, complicated as it may seem. Um, if you start to understand their behavioral repertoire, you can really adapt very simple things from home uh, to really enrich their lives in a very strong and impactful way. And so uh, when it's all said and done, you should be your pet's favorite enrichment toy. This is one of my patients. So this is just a pet that was just in the hospital with us like two days ago. Um, the other thing I just wanted to end on is that your pet should also be your enrichment. Um, I get to meet all of you guys as pets every day, you know, usually in pretty stressful situations. I just want to let you know that they also reward other people's lives. This bird made so many people happy in the hospital. I can't tell you people were coming from different floors just to say hi to this bird. Um, and it was sick and it was getting better, but um, just so that you know, um, your, your companions are connected to you. So sometimes you are their best friend um, and also they're our best friends too. So thank you guys for listening. I know I went over, I'm really sorry, but I'd be happy to take some simple questions. There's a whole laundry list of them. This is amazing. Um, thank you again. Um, let's see. Let's go through. Maybe type your questions again if you don't mind. Yeah. So I see some health questions. I see one that says um, home visits for baby QT. I remember this owner. Um, I think because of COVID. Uh, things are kind of still a little scary with regards to, um, you know, trying to make sure that people are quarantined and safe. Um, I see another question about a turtle. Oh, there's 10 messages flooding. Here we go. Sorry, I'm trying to catch up. One thing I just wanted to ask, I, I know when we reached out to you, Dr. Latney, to, to do this, you were saying, I was going to get in touch with you guys because you're really worried that this is very stressful for exotic pets. So just every the quarantine and everything. So can you, I know we know that we hear that a lot about cats and dogs, but yeah. how this is affecting exotic pets as well. Yeah, that's actually a really great question. So um, on the receiving end, what we have been seeing is that um, again, sometimes routines are very important to our exotic um, animal pets. 
um, especially for birds. And so um, sometimes if there's a number of people in the house and everyone's healthy and happy, um, that's, a, that's a return of a flock, which might be new for that bird. It might be a good scenario. Um, but what's really important is that um, a number of pets, I truly feel can sense um, when their human companions are not feeling well, when they're stressed. Um, and especially if, you know, we don't realize it, but we may be emoting um, sadness. And I think that's something that all of us can identify with right now. Um, and it's interesting to see that the pets are starting, their behaviors are starting to change because of that. Um, and so I, I, when I reached out, I was just like, we've got to do something for the mental health of these pets. <laughs> you know, they're, they're at home with owners that are stressed. Um, they're at home with owners. They don't know what COVID is. They don't know, they don't understand. Um, they're witnessing illness. They're, you know, some pets, unfortunately, have, have experienced a loss of their long-term companions. Um, it's just very stressful. And um, that could have a very strong emotional um, and mental weight on a pet. Um, so there's kind of like a range of, I think, things um, that are occurring right now with um, captive exotic pets um, that could definitely be challenging, um, like even their mental health. The other thing is that um, some people are now at home in closer proximity to the animals. And these guys are stoic by the level of how they're hardwired in their brain. And so the one thing we've been seeing on our side is um, a number of clients um, reach out to us when they've all of a sudden been like around enough to notice that something's not quite right with their pet. And so they end up coming to us. And so we also find that owners are newly um, noticing diseases in them or noticing that they're ill or under the weather. Um, so we've seen both of those things. Um, but again, one of the things that I wanted to, you know, reiterate is like with the video, the last one I just showed you, um, you know, we're all, we're all pretty stressed. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, it can be really challenging at the times that we deal with, and we deal with animals that are ill all the time. And that has a really like huge emotional weight on us. Um, you know, I'm sad when my, my patients aren't feeling well and I'm a very aggressive patient advocate. Um, it's really, you know, sometimes when we can get them through things, it's great, but we also try to make sure we provide an enriching environment, even in the hospital. Um, because they can also sense when you're not feeling well, they can sense when we're off of our game. And so the same way in which I was just saying, um, you know, we want to try to do the best that we can to help their mental health. This um, one patient, unfortunately, also lost a number of people in the, in the household, they, they moved out. And so the bird wasn't receiving the same amount of enrichment that it was accustomed to getting. Um, and counter to what one would think when it came to a hospital, all of a sudden, there's a bunch of people everywhere. Um, and all very concerned. Um, birds see us taking care of a lot of different things. Um, this bird saw me take care of multiple animals. It observed me, it observed me. And within 12 hours, it was just like, oh, this is a caretaker. I'm gonna be affectionate with her. And then all of a sudden we start screaming and hoo-ha and, and then droves of you know nurses from different departments, doctors from different departments come in. And the bird's like, all I gotta do is make a noise to get people to show up, this is fantastic. And you know, that bird helped our mental health for that day. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was nice. Um, so I just want to ex express that, that some of these, um, you know, sometimes this results in physical illnesses for these pets too. Um, and in a way, you know, you know, ferrets can get COVID, hamsters can get COVID, so they can be directly impacted by the disease. Um, they don't get as sick as us, thank goodness, but also the repercussions of how COVID has made us sick and had us change our way of life. Um, has, you know, definitely taken a toll on the mental health of the pets. Um, they experience loss, um, you know, they grieve, they mourn, um, and we've all gone through that. And most importantly, like I said, you are their most, you're their companion, you're their most important enrichment toy. So when something changes with your behavior, their language is behavior. Um, yeah. But, and so it's, there's a lot, there's a huge impact that's made on them. So I just wanted to communicate that um, in a way they are our treatment right now. <laughs> and also, um, you know, we want to make sure we enrich their lives as much as possible. Great. I saw one question about the, um, for the more social exotic pets, um, about separation anxiety and the fact that we've all been around so much and 
when at some point if we leave to go back to work just is there anything you can do to guard against that now that's a really fantastic question um so yeah so you're right there's been this shift in the dynamic where all of a sudden we're home more frequently um i say as we start to revisit like start to enter the new phases one thing you always want to do and that, and that's also a part of the enrichment is to make sure that there's things for your pet to do in your absence and sometimes that means you have to teach them how to play with toys sometimes you have to teach them what the enrichment item is um and what i do is just kind of like i take small steps i really do think if you guys can uh, um you know if you can manage to get the presence app um i'll just type it here love that yeah uh, because you you learn more about your pet's behavior when you're paying attention to what they're doing when you're not there um I just want to warn owners, it can be, it can hit you hard. Um, we've seen, I've streamed a number of my pets videos and I, you know, I had to go off to a conference, I have my friends checking on my pets, you know, and I'm watching the live feed and I'm like, huh, my gecko didn't come out at 8 PM the day. She knows I'm not there, you know? And uh, sometimes we'll see them not be active for a long period of time until you come home. And those can have a huge emotional weight on us. But I tell owners not to feel like disenfranchised. Just make sure that, um, again, you're going to have an emotion. Um, but we want, the, we want the outcome to be that we can try to afford them a better enrichment and better coping tools, um, as we all have to develop our own coping tools. And one, the, the surefire way to do that is to teach them that they don't have to focus their energy all into one thing. Um, of course, rabbits are social. Of course, dogs and cats are social. Um, of course, rabbits, you know, spend a lot of time we saw socializing. Um, but rabbits, I video, will do binkies and parkour by themselves, <laughs> you know, sometimes when they're motivated. Um, so I would say try to stage it, uh, video them and if you can make small approximations to distancing yourself, um, that might replicate a scenario that you will find yourself going back to when you revisit um, you know, the outside world workforce. Um, and just, I hate to say it, but spy on them so that you can at least have the tools to know what you can do to help them um, help with coping with that, that environmental change. That's great, that's great. Um, and I really love what you said that they are our enrichment, which is, so true you know and and i think it's they're so comforting and the best part about being home is just being with our pets so i um i love it yeah awesome okay um let's see here's one okay yeah well i, I know i saw one about chinchillas and neutering i don't do you want to talk a little bit sort of off topic but just neutering in different um exotic pets oh yeah uh, that's yeah. um so yeah. So for some cases, for certain animals, um, you know, removing a part of their reproductive anatomy um, is what we consider to be preventative health. Um, take, for instance, the case for rabbits, like in cats and dogs, you know, we remove, um, you know, the reproductive anatomy to prevent um, an overpopulation or accidental pregnancies, um, to prevent disease, to correct for disease that might be in the reproductive tract. Um, and to prevent for the development of cancer later on later in life. Um, this is definitely true for our female rabbits. Again, I talked about how young they are when they're able to make replicas of themselves <laughs> for months. Um, by the age of two, uh, we see that their uterus undergoes pretty aggressive endometrial changes. Um, and they're actually at a really high percent of um, percentage in terms of um, odds ratio of developing uterine cancer um if they're not spayed um the good news is that the cancer grows very slowly very localized the bad news is there's an 80 percent chance they'll develop it um and so we tend to see the slow growing cancer in like nine-year-old or ten-year-old female rabbits that haven't been spayed and so for them we kind of think up oh, preventative if we can spay these ladies as soon as we can we need to do this because we know it prevents this thing that we know is almost inevitably going to happen in most scenarios um, owners, um, sometimes I have a mixed bag about neutering uh, male rabbits. I'll tell you why. Um, much rarer for them to develop cancerous situations or disease processes associated with their reproductive tract. Um, owners definitely like to do it to prevent spraying behavior and sexual behaviors that we consider to be undesired. So like marking with urine and things like that or like 
um, humping behaviors, for lack of a better term. I just want to inform the owners, um, the hump, like after a certain period of time, yes, testosterone will start to drive a behavioral change in as early as six months of age. Um, but once they learn the behaviors at that six month mark, even if we do neuter them, they've learned the behavior. Okay. So sometimes it doesn't make it disappear. They're like, this was fun. I learned that this was fun, independent of my hormones. Um, for chinchillas, um, I'd say for chinchillas, hamsters, gerbils, we tend not to neuter them often. Um, the procedure itself is definitely more risky um, in terms of development of secondary bacterial infections and it's not as straightforward as we see in our um, rabbit friends. Ferrets usually come already neutered and descented, um, and spayed and descented. Um, we do encourage people to consider getting their female guinea pigs spayed um, because they too, on the flip side where bunnies get uterine disease, guinea pigs get ovarian disease. Um, and so at a very early age. So we like to try to encourage owners if they can spare it. And if, um, you know, the situation is that they're a good surgical candidate that we encourage that they have that surgery done. Um, reptiles, a whole nother ballpark. Usually we're doing uh, corrective um, like interventions because there's disease present. We don't really do it preemptively. Um, there's very few people who know how to do that in the vet field confidently because there's you know, over 7,000 reptiles, they all have different systems. <laughs> so um, it's not as straightforward um, as the other species, but it can be done. Um, birds, contrary to popular belief, um, we know that females have egg laying problems. Um, we don't usually like to do surgery unless it's a um, necessary intervention because it's a pretty high risk surgery. Um, again, their anatomy is very unique um, and the disease process, their metabolism is 10 times faster than ours. If you can think of that comparatively, the disease process is moving 10 times faster <laughs> than it would in us in a very fragile system. Um, so they are at 